Yes, very much so. There's a great Oscar Wilde quote uh, where he was insulting somebody. I can't remember the Earl of something. He said, his mind is like a soup dish, wide but shallow. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at our relationships these days with social media. You know, friend doesn't quite mean what it once did. And there is an argument, and there's a TED talk on this by Professor Sherry Turkle, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting at TED and who I absolutely agree with. Uh, her book is called Alone Together. And her thesis, having been a great proponent of technology and how it's bringing us together in a global village and all that kind of stuff, she now believes that actually technology, the way we relate to it, is driving us apart. It's creating a lot of very shallow relationships instead of a few deep ones. And I think one of those relationships, sadly, for many people, is with music. This is Crisis Cast 2020 with me, Toby Goodman, a podcast where I get timely wisdom from experts in life and business. These guests will answer my five questions, sharing wisdom and insights to help you and me get through this global shitstorm. Today on Crisis Cast 2020, Not many people can say they have a TED Talk, even fewer can boast five with over 100 million combined views. Julian Treasure is part of that exclusive club and joins me today from Orkney, an archipelago off the northeastern coast of Scotland. I first found Julian through his TED Talks and discovered a speaker, an author and a businessman who was able to concisely articulate and justify why I and so many of us have such strong feelings about the way sound affects us. In this conversation, we speak about the power of audio, why great listening skills are so valuable and yet so undervalued, and how we can use listening to become better communicators. Before we start the show, I have something for you if you identify as pod curious. It's perfect for you if you're an expert, consultant or business owner. Maybe you're wondering if podcasting is worth the effort, especially now, or perhaps you've tried podcasting in the past but have been disappointed with the results. In this free guide, Podstar, I'll share the exact seven steps we use to help publish over 2,000 podcasts each month. To get instant access, go to podcastnetworksolutions.com. Julian Treasure, welcome to Crisis Cast 2020. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you for having me. So I'm speaking with you on July the 8th, 2020. How's the coronavirus pandemic affected your life on a personal and local level? You live in Orkney and you're the first person that I've spoken with who lives up there. Well, we haven't had a lot of cases up here. We have a a few, Uh, but we are effectively imprisoned because uh, you're not allowed to get on a plane or on a boat without, you know, the correct papers. So we can't travel anywhere, which is not, uh, I think, the case in most of the UK. You can travel at least five miles. Well, I guess we can travel five, five miles on the island. That's one thing which is there in the background, not that we've wanted to go anywhere. I think it's probably been a lot easier for us than for many people because the density of population up here is quite low. It's a beautiful place. We've been able to go out and, you know, walk down to the beach, which isn't far away. So nature is a great palliative and we've been able to enjoy that. As far as my work is concerned, my company, the Sound Agency, has been working virtually for well over five years. So it didn't make any difference at all to us, except that income dried up. So we've had to furlough most of the people. And hopefully we're just starting to see some sort of recovery happening in client intentions. Uh, Otherwise, it's all going to get very scary by the end of this year. So certainly, you know, plenty of stress in that direction. But as far as quality of life is concerned, we've been very lucky, I think, living up here. Now you're in the business of helping your clients speak so that people listen. That's that's part of what you do outside of the sound agency, which we'll come to in a little bit. When it comes to this online only communication that we've all been forced into, what have you observed in the last few months that's been changing for people? Clearly, there have been millions of people who've um, embarked on a, a journey of virtual meetings who have never used this stuff before, really. They might have had the very odd 
Skype call or something like that or a FaceTime call. But, you know, the, one of the big winners, as everybody knows, out of this crisis uh, in, globally has been Zoom. And it's become a generic word like Hoover or Google now. And I'll Zoom you. I think there are some interesting things about doing this on a regular basis. First of all, everybody has discovered you can do it. And I think the world has changed forever as a result of that. I do not expect the new normal ever to be the old normal in the sense that there were lots and lots of people flying around America, around the world, spending days in travel uh, creating lots of carbon, spending lots of money, wasting lots of time to go and see somebody for a one-hour meeting when we're now discovering, actually, you know what? You can have that one-hour meeting and have only five minutes before and after it to get to where you have to get to. So I think everybody's starting to realize that a new way is possible. Now, of course, that's not going to replace face-to-face -face altogether. There are times when we need to meet people. There's going to be reason for offices to exist. Things like serendipity, the fabled water cooler conversation where you bump into somebody, there's a conversation and something amazing comes out of that. Well, that kind of thing doesn't really happen on Slack or Microsoft Teams to the same extent. We've used Slack for years. It's brilliant. Uh, but in terms of serendipity, not so much. I mean, we do miss out on that kind of thing by not having a central office where we're all wandering around and bumping into each other and overhearing things and having ideas and bouncing them off people and that kind of thing. So, you know, you lose some stuff and physical meetings will always be important, but I do think a huge chunk of them are not going to happen in the future. And we will have moved to this form of communication, which has got pluses and minuses. One of the pluses if you are doing it with video on, which, you know, we're not at the moment, we're, we're being much more Pythagorean. Uh, you know, the story about Pythagoras, he had his first year students, the Akuzmatoi, uh, sit in a lecture space and there was a screen erected so that you could not see the teacher on the basis that he considered that sight was distracting and you learn by listening. Well, I think that's a pretty powerful message. But if you have got video on, it's clearly rude if you're on a video conference with somebody to be, you know, lying back with your feet up and doing texts at the same time. Now, you might well be doing that at the moment. I don't know because we've got video off. So an audio only call is a different beast from a video conference. Clearly, the audio is the most important part. As I often uh, am fond of saying, you know, video conference is a bit of a misnomer, really, because the video is nice to have extra. You know, we can carry on perfectly well like this. We are in audio only. Uh, if we were doing a video conference and the audio goes down, we're stuffed, aren't we? What are we going to do? Hold up bits of paper, use sign language, uh, smoke signals, I don't know. The audio is the crucial element in the communication. The sound is the most important part. The video is a nice extra. But once we get used to it, and we have, then uh, it does have slightly different rules. Even if you're face-to-face -face with somebody, it's quite common for that person to be distracted. We've all got very used to talking into a distracted listening, which is unfortunate. Uh, you know, Scott Peck said, the American author said, you cannot truly listen to another human being and do anything else at the same time, which I think is absolutely true, but it's a very rare thing these days. And I do think that video conferencing tends to promote that. So this is a plus. I think if you're looking at a screen, you feel uncomfortable if you're not actually paying attention and looking at the person. Uh, you know, it's pretty clear if you're tapping away on your keyboard and actually looking at a completely different application. So uh, I do think it promotes more intense listening, certainly on one-to-ones. Not so much if you're talking to a screen full of 20 or 30 people, then it's pretty hard. And of course, there are many distractions that go along with it. Bandwidth issues, not to mention people not knowing how to use it properly and leaving their sound unmuted with dogs barking or children in the background, uh, which we all have, or many of us have in these days because we're working from home. It can be problematic, but I do think there is an interesting plus to it, which is a more careful and attentive connection with another person, 
even sometimes than one we would have in person. Yeah. I was speaking with someone recently who did a talk in front of thousands of people via Zoom. He was going to be doing it in person from stage. He was surprised at how well it went. But I just wonder how, what your ideas are on, on the differences in presentation style when you're dealing with a, a Zoom call full of you know, tens of people plus, is there, are there any specific things, any moments in time? Do you need to check in with people often? Do you need to use the chat box? Like, what, what does that look like? It's pretty hard to do all of those things at the same time as presenting, because when you're presenting, you need to be fully present and um, totally focused on what you're doing. Um, so most of the time, if you're doing a big thing like that, I mean, I've done, I've done Zoom um, presentations to uh, many hundreds of people at the same time. And I like to focus on just what I'm doing, which means you need people around you helping, managing chat, uh, filtering questions, um, dealing with if you do breakouts or small groups or any of these kinds of things, making sure that all happens and everybody knows what they're doing and so forth. It's much more complicated than it would be to stand on stage and say to everybody, all right, every other person stand up and go over there. You know, you can direct things like that much more easily. The other big downside is lack of feedback. You know, when I'm standing on a stage, one of the things that I teach uh, in, in my book and in my online course and in all the work I've done, one of the big things I teach is the concept of speaking into a listening and asking yourself the question, what's the listening I'm speaking into? Whether it's one person or a thousand, there's a listening. And it comes about through the filters that the other person or people have got. You know, we all listen through a set of filters, which we develop over time. Uh, the language we speak, the culture we're born into, whether that's local or national or whatever it might be, familial. Um, the values, attitudes, beliefs that we accrete along the way our intentions and expectations in any given situation, the emotions we've got going on, all of these things create filters. So our listening changes minute to minute almost. And it is absolutely untrue that everybody listens like I do. And that's a, the biggest and most common mistake in communication that I find is people assuming everybody listens like I do. Well, they don't. Everybody's listening is unique, as unique as their fingerprints. So it's a really powerful question to ask yourself, what's the listening I'm speaking into? And face to face with one person or 10,000, you have some cues there coming back. Uh, they may be body language, pheromones, uh, little, you know, verbal cues or clues, all sorts of things coming back, which give you some indication. You might know something about the person or people in advance. You might have researched them to take a guess at the listening. And I'm talking about things like, you know, is it an older listening or a younger listening? Or is it a, a listening for something? Do they have an intention that they're trying to draw something out? Are these kinds of things you can ask yourself in advance and think about who you're going to be speaking to. And that means you're much more likely to hit the bullseye than miss the target altogether. Well, online, that's pretty much missing. So there is really a dearth of valuable feedback unless you're doing breakout groups and monitoring the responses and uh, watching the chat as it comes in. Very hard, as I said, to do two things at the same time. Uh, so the pre-research is extremely important. Understanding the audience as well as you can in advance, tailoring what you're going to say to you know, their needs, their problems. What is it they, they want to, where do they want to go with this 40 minutes you're with them or whatever it may be. Uh, but you don't get the same degree of feedback as standing on a stage and actually being able to see the whole room and feel the mood and what's coming back. Yeah, I was speaking with Tony Martinetti, who was, I think, episode 24, and he was talking about how he would always have someone with him working the chat box um, when, when he was delivering. And also the observation that he'd realized that some people who he'd been working with in person in a group setting were a lot less shy when they were able to use the chat box than he perhaps 
thought they were in the first place. You know, their communication style was, they were much braver because they were able to type rather than ask. Well, that goes for a lot of people, doesn't it? And unfortunately, it goes to the nth degree if you look at comments under YouTube videos or uh, if you're indulging yourself in Twitter or whatever, where um, trolling and just abuse are extremely common. And the kinds of things that I'm sure those people wouldn't say if they were face to face with somebody. But um, it's, it's, I mean, the, 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 the rise of text and typing. Uh, in general, has been one of the biggest social factors over the last 50 or 60 years, you know, starting with email and moving through to instant messaging and text or SMS and social media and various other platforms. Uh, Well, you know, that's very recent, actually. We've been using speaking and listening. We've been using complex language for uh, getting on for 200,000 years. We've only invented writing 4,000 years ago. So it's a very recent uh, upstart, really, in communication terms. And yet it's kind of taken over. And the research shows that particularly younger people are much more comfortable texting. You know, it's, it's safer, isn't it, to text somebody and ask them out or to text somebody and break up with them. You're not there. You don't have to deal with the reaction. It's kind of at arm's length. It's remote. You're insulated. Uh, so you can be braver in that way. Well, there's pl- pros and cons about that, I think. Uh, I am a great fan of speaking and listening. And I think it's a great shame that these two incredibly important skills are not taught at school, barely at all. You know, it's a scandal if a child leaves school unable to read or write. But children leave school every year, unfortunately, millions of them worldwide, having never been taught how to use this amazing instrument we all play, the human voice, and having never been taught how to listen consciously, because listening is a skill. It's not a natural ability. And we just don't teach it, which is tragic in my view. It's very tragic. And I know you're a great believer in music and and all that brings to listening skills, right? Yes, well, music uh, is is a key sound really in the world. I mean, there isn't a human society that's ever been discovered that doesn't have music. So it springs up independently. It hasn't been translated like a, well, I was going to say a virus. Let's not use that word, but it translated. Uh, it hasn't been translated around the world by some sort of osmosis. It springs naturally inside of people and communities. And so it, to be human is to be musical. To be musical is to be human. We're not the only species that uses music, of course, but uh, it is incredibly important part of being a human being. And uh, I think the studied listening to music is um, is a wonderful skill. You know, I, I talked in my book to Benjamin Zander, the con- conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, who did a wonderful TED talk about listening to classical music. And um, I think he's right in that paying attention to it and understanding it, you're making the effort to open that door, not just have it as some sort of veneer, uh, which incidentally is something the sound agency works against constantly in the world. Uh, the, the idea of background music plastering every surface. Um, it's just unfortunate. Music mostly is made to be listened to. You know, I don't think there are that many recording studios in the world with people hunched over a mixing desk at two in the morning saying, let's make something nobody wants to listen to. That's not what it's there for. There is, you know, a small subset of music that's made specifically to be in the background. Uh, Brian Eno kind of started that off in the late 70s with ambient music. And so, you know, there is stuff there. And the sound agency has moved that conversation on, I think, a little bit with uh, creating generative uh, ambient soundscapes, uh, which are created live by algorithms in a computer. They're not recorded at all and they're they're occupying a space somewhere between silence and music so you know there's a range of sound and music i think is best when we pay attention to it and it does make me quite sad the way that music consumption has changed over the last 30 years 40 years uh you know i remember there was a time when i would go out and buy an album 
you know, a vinyl album and bring it home and sit religiously listening to it both sides over and over again in, with a pair of headphones on in a darkened room, reading the back, avidly reading the back of the LP um, to understand who was on it and, oh, they played on that. You know, there was a kind of intense relationship there. And what I see now a lot of the time is people having music on in the background. And again, you know, I don't think you can listen to music and be doing other things at the same time, not really listen to it. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong to have music on in the background, but I do think it's very important and almost sacred with a lot of music to give it the attention it deserves. You know, a huge amount of creative energy went into making it. And in most cases anyway, um, I mean, I, I can accept there's a lot of bad music, you know, the old Dizzy Gillespie comment, there's two kinds of music, good and bad. Um, well, I, I would also say, I think there's two kinds of music, music that's made for love and music that's made for money. I'm not so interested in the second of those, uh, but I can tell pretty much, uh, you know, you can feel it if somebody's made this because they need to express this because they love it. And I think it behooves all of us to pay the attention that that deserves to that piece of music and not have it on in a burger bar when we're doing something else. Amen. Uh, I find it almost disrespectful to have music on in the background. And despite spending 20 years of my life playing music professionally and only doing that, um, I largely live in quite a silent house because I don't like that low level din i can't i can't i can't deal with it and and maybe other people can but yeah i i really i really agree with that and also having listened to what you've just said and read a version of what you've just said before from your book reminds me that i've been in situations when i was younger where i invested my pocket money or whatever in in an album and listened to it and not really liked it <laughs> But because it was the only thing I had to listen to that week, I listened to it again and I listened to it again. And and probably some of my favorite albums and music was initially stuff that I didn't really like on first listen and now mm. love. So I've come to understand because sometimes music challenges you. Sometimes, you know, you do find it, find it jarring or you're not used to, it could be a chord sequence or a, or a, rhythm that you're uncomfortable with but actually it turns out that if you invest that time really listening and you you get more out of it just like when you start a sometimes you can start a, a film and it all appears a bit too long-winded but if you if you wait it out and you get half an hour in or you watch the first episode of that box set it, it was worth investing the time getting to know the characters yes very much so there's a great oscar wilde quote uh, where he was insulting somebody i can't remember the earl of something he said his mind is like a soup dish, wide but shallow. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at our relationships these days with social media. You know, friend doesn't quite mean what it once did. And there is an argument, and there's a TED talk on this by uh, Professor Sherry Turkle, uh, who I had the pleasure of meeting at TED and who I absolutely agree with. Uh, her book is called Alone Together. And her thesis, having been a great proponent of technology and how it's bringing us together in a global village and all that kind of stuff, she now believes that actually technology, the way we relate to it, is driving us apart. It's creating a lot of very shallow relationships instead of a few deep ones. And I think one of those relationships, sadly, for many people, is with music. So I think a lot of people have this kind of shallow relationship with music where it's somebody else's playlist, bang it on, have it on in the background, put the headphones on as you're going about doing something else. It's always a kind of partial listening. And that's something which becomes a habit. And it's very much the opposite of what I believe in. I mean, I'm accepting that it's a busy world and we can't focus entirely on one thing at a time all the time. Nevertheless, I do think it's very important from time to time to stop, put things aside and focus and be present and be conscious in our awareness and in our listening, whether that's to another person. I mean, I would challenge everybody listening to this, uh, maybe this evening when you go home or maybe you are at home and you, when you finish listening to this, go and listen to somebody 
in your family or a colleague. Actually listen. I have a little acronym for this. RASA, receive, appreciate, summarize, ask. So the receive is look at the person all the time when they're talking. Don't be doing something else. The appreciate is little noises that we tend to make or little movements, you know, head jogs, smiles, eyebrow raises. Oh, really? Mm, Those little encouraging sounds which show you're present. The S summarizes the word so. So what I understand you say is this. Did I get that correct? Or so what we've all agreed is this. Now we can move on to that. So is a really important word. It's like closing doors in the corridor of a conversation. You know, you lock things down behind you and you can move on. And the A is ask questions. Ideally open-ended questions. Why, what, where, who, when, which, all those kind of questions which don't permit the answer yes or no, and which open more conversation. You know, tell me more about that. That's really interesting. Encouraging those kind of um, expansions of a conversation That is a very powerful way of listening. And giving somebody 100% of your attention is such a generous gift and such a rare gift these days. You'll probably find people will look at you strangely and go, what are you doing? (laughs) Because they're not used to having that degree of spotlight attention put on them. But it's an amazing thing for helping with relationships. I mean, what's the most common complaint in a relationship? He or she never listens to me. And well, there's a reason for that, because we've got sloppy at it and we've kind of lost our understanding of it. Listening is a skill. You can work at it. You can improve it. You can do exercises to improve it. And, you know, I've got some on my website um, and I talked about some in my TED talk about conscious listening, which incidentally has been seen by about one fifth, I think, as many people as my TED talk on speaking. That one's got like 40 million views. <laughs> the sixth most watched TED talk of all time on speaking. The one on listening, way less. And that, I think, says something about the priorities that we all have these days. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is great. I'm doing a lot of nodding, which you can't see at the moment, but uh, I am. A couple of things just always take me back to my music education when I read your work and listen to you speak. And the, the first one is that even in, in the early, well, mid nineties, when I was doing my A-levels, having a music teacher saying, when was the last time you only listened to music? And this was before iPods. This was CD territory, I guess, for us. So tapes and CDs and You know, he was saying, well, what were you doing while you were listening to music? You're supposed to be a music student. What were you, you know, while I was drawing or I was running or I was doing, you know, just please just, just only listen to music, (laughs) you know, and, and his, his absolute despair at the fact that his, his students who were, who were supposedly studying this stuff wouldn't actually only listen to music. They had to pair it with something else. Yeah. And the other thing that I remember is this great jazz piano player, British jazz piano player, singer and educator called Pete Churchill. When I was whinging about the inability to practice drums in my college dorm because they're drums, he simply said to me, never forget that listening is practice. You don't actually Mm. have to be playing all the time. Like just go and listen to this, this and this and come back because you'll be a better musician if you truly sit down and listen to it. Mm. Great stuff. Tell me about your business, Sound Agency. You're an expert in helping develop sound environments away from the computer as well in in real, actual life. While sound levels seem to be slowly returning, there are some noises, airplanes, for example, that aren't being heard as much. Do you think that we'll be more sensitive to sound and noise now that even the busiest of cities has had a break from it? Well, I do hope so, you know. I think there's no doubt that noise levels globally have declined because people have been locked up. So, you know, we haven't been out in our cars, in our planes, um, doing the stuff that we do, making the noise that we tend to make. And there's a huge social cost to that. I'm fully aware of it. Uh, I suppose one just has to be grateful for the small mercies. And one of the small mercies is the world has got quieter. And just possibly people will like it like that. And, um, you know, it'll become... 
a little bit more of an issue. It's not a noise is not a political issue. You know, it's a huge killer noise. We lose millions of years of happy life every year in Europe. It's been measured because of noise. Uh, it's wrecking sleep for millions and millions of people at night after night, traffic noise. Um, you know, neighbor noise causes violence. Noise and violence, noise and aggression are very closely allied. You know, there's not many wars that are, are fought in silence. So if you think about it, that kind of roaring and expression of anger, um, you know, the police, uh, I know, have often said when they come to the scene of a violent crime, there's often noise going on. Um, there is this association. So I think it's a good thing that noise is reducing. Um, it will probably come back, maybe not to the same degree it did, because, you know, we talked about carbon and flying earlier. Who knows the way that that will pan out? We're going to have an interesting situation in many built environments where social distancing and, you know, two meters or one meter or whatever it is, you know, we're going to have less density in buildings. Uh, well, that's to a degree a good thing because the overall noise level will go down. But uh, there's a thing called the irrelevant sound effect, ISE, uh, we're inside of buildings, which is the way that sound distracts you. The most distracting sound of all, if you're trying to think, of course, is other people's conversations, unwanted conversation, um, where you know you have no earlids, you're programmed to decode language. And if somebody's behind you talking about their great night out, we all know it's impossible to concentrate and to listen to the little voice in your head, which is the one you need to listen to if you're writing or editing or doing numbers or whatever it might be, anything complex. So it may well be that the distraction level in offices goes up because there's less babble and you can distinguish more individual voices, which is extremely distracting. Um, so that's the kind of thing we take on at the sound agency. We've got a thing called Mood Sonic, which is this generative uh, sound. And we've just launched one actually in the wake of COVID, um, a special sound soundscape called Reassurance because. You know, it occurred to us that a lot of people are going to feel pretty uncomfortable going back into close proximity with others. We've all been locked down for such a long time. I mean, so my five-year-old daughter, uh, you know, we're going on holiday in a couple of weeks' time, we're going to drive around Scotland. Well, she's nervous about it because we've been here for three months. We've hardly left the house for three months. And I think a lot of people have got that underlying sense of, well, I've got to go back to the office. Do I really want to be near to people like that? I think the, uh, there was a number that 40% of patients in America are delaying going to see their doctor because they feel uncertain and frightened of catching something or whatever it may be. This fear is there. So we created this soundscape called Reassurance, which has got nature sound, biophilic sound, birdsong, tends to make us feel secure because we've learned over hundreds of thousands of years that when the birds are singing, things are normally safe. Uh, it's got some running water in it, uh, which is good for masking. And it's also the sound of cleanliness. You know, even if we are going to be frantically cleaning spaces, you can't see that. You might just be able to smell it, I suppose. Um, but people are going to be putting in hard surfaces, low down, cleanable everything. It will be religiously cleaned as regularly as possible, but you can't see it. So the sound of purity and cleanliness can help to reduce that kind of discomfort. And then we're also putting in some musical sounds, um, probably uh, classical, solo piano, very gentle Chopin style. It'll be generative. It'll be created by an algorithm. But in that style, because most people associate classical music of that kind with kindness, gentleness, and quality as well. So there's a lot of, most sound, I'm sure you know, most sound works by association. And so there's a lot of associations being built into this soundscape, which is designed to play very much at an ambient level in the background, but just to create a feeling of calm security, to reduce stress levels, reduce anxiety levels somewhat. Sound can do all of that, you know. Sound is so powerful, and yet it's so rare that we design environments with our ears. Mostly they're designed purely for the eyes and the sound is just a byproduct of the way they look and what people are doing. And very, very often it's counterproductive. So that's the, we're trying to point in the opposite direction from that and make some productive sound that can actually help in these situations. 
my feeling is that a lot of people unconsciously know that you know, well they they unconsciously they realize that something's not quite right and they are unable to articulate it i've got <laughs> clearly quite a few professional musician friends who are able to articulate that and and um are obsessed with with silence you know i'm thinking if i can think of at least five or six people that are obsessed with the sound environment they're in um to the point where they won't go to crowded places and they won't um they like to have control of the sound i think that these people who are used to making it <laughs> are, mm. are very are very used to um just wanting silence if they're not making their own noise but yeah i mean what you're doing with the creating sounds with algorithms for reassurance is is incredible and i'd love to i'd love to hear some of that um i'd also love to uh, introduce you to a, a child psychologist that i spoke with as well about uh, dealing with how to get your how to get your child back into back into school and reassuring them and 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 working with them um i too have a uh, a couple of young kids so these are these are the new conversations we're having right it's mm. Yeah, really interesting. Um, Very much so. But there is a lot of fear around, you know, and fear gives rise to a lot of negative things in the world. So yeah. um, if we can start thinking about that and thinking about counteracting that, understanding it, uh, not building it as we see so often happening, particularly in America at the moment, um, creating fear is such a sad thing to do um, because most of us get crippled when we're in that kind of situation, when we're really nervous about things. So. That's very much our intention. And uh, yes, well, you can uh, have a listen to Mood Sonic on the Mood Sonic website, which surprisingly is moodsonic.com. Um, we're really excited about this as a, uh, it's getting phenomenal. Well, just before COVID hit, <laughs> it was getting phenomenal traction around the world. Already got the first installation going into a 12 story building in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and it's, you know, it is designing with the ears. It can be zoned, it can be controlled. You, you mentioned control. That's a really important thing. I mean, it's clear from the research that lack of control is something that people don't like in their sound environment. I mean, noise is the number one complaint in modern offices, in hospitals, in hotels, in restaurants, in, you know, just about everywhere in schools. Um, and yet, sadly, there's no votes in, you know, standing up and saying, vote for me, I'll make it quieter. It's, it's kind of a, it's a hidden killer. It's a hidden destroyer of our happiness, our effectiveness, our well-being. And um, so part of our job is to raise people's consciousness of it um, and to, to get architects in particular who, you know, they train in America. They train for five years at least. And I've spoken to them. And do you know how much time they spend on sound in five years? It's on. like one, one day. <laughs> They might, they might do a week if they do a kind of particular unit on acoustics. But it's not surprising, right. therefore, that they come out and they design things just for the eyes. This, is, this looks fantastic. We've had to go into numerous spaces which have been designed by award-winning architects, which look amazing, and they are unbearable to be in. So they need to be treated with acoustic treatments afterwards to make them habitable and functional spaces yeah i just my my dad just just got out of hospital not with not with uh covid but uh he was in for a week or so and the first few days he was in a a room on his own nhs um and and he was okay you know day day two day three he was he was getting better and i spoke with him and he seemed positively chipper when i spoke with him of course we couldn't visit him <laughs> Uh, because of what's going on. And then on day four, because he was recovering well, they moved him to a ward. And then I spoke to him and he s started to sound ill again. Mm. Because of course he's in a ward uh, with all sorts going on, lack of, fun mm. lack of funding with uh, some dodgy toilets and all sorts of stuff and people shouting mm. and, and BP stress, anxiety inducing machinery all around, not just his, mm. but everyone else's. And so when I spoke to him, he's just got out yesterday. He's 
sounded worse than he sounded before he went in. And, mm. and now he's recovering at home. And, and purely what I'm hearing is that the most stressful thing was just the constant interruption from a noise mm. standpoint. Absolutely. Well, the noise levels in hospitals are disastrous. There's a study, famous study that was done by Johns Hopkins, where they found that noise levels by day were 12 times the World Health, Health Organization recommended maximum, 12 times as loud. So, you know, this is, as you said, it's people, but it's also alarms, beeps, all these kind of hisses. How anybody gets well in that environment is amazing. And that's something we really need to look at. And the same with schools, you know, classroom acoustics are diabolical. So millions of children sitting at the back can hardly hear. They're having to join the dots and work really hard to hear what the teacher's saying, uh, which is a tragedy, I think, you know, just not to being able to hear your education. It's like watering a garden and missing the plants altogether. It's ridiculous. So there's a, there's a long way to go with all these things. There's a lot yeah. to do. It comes originally, I think, going back to what we talked about before, it will come from teaching children at school about the importance of hearing, the importance of listening, and the importance of sound in their lives. Uh, because if we leave school completely unconscious, it's, you know, it's a minor miracle of, apart from musicians, if anybody starts listening carefully. Uh, you know, musicians are lucky because you have to, if you're going to be a good musician, you have to have an attentive multi-track listening. You're listening to everybody in the band or everybody in the orchestra at the same time. And that's the only way you can fit in and contribute. So it's an organic thing. But people who don't play an instrument and who don't have that experience, it, it's so easy to get numb to sound. There's so much noise around us, just deadened to it and sucked into this thing of intensity, multiple inputs at the same time going to be looking at two screens and a tv and music on in the background and having a conversation and cookie and egg you know um well i don't think that's a very uh, powerful way to live your life and I, I do think we need to take a step back from that and, and the access to consciousness as far as i'm concerned is listening yeah and my concern is looking at the classroom plans right now and they've gone back to the old school you know teacher at the front and you put the naughty kids at the back and they get disengaged whereas we're starting to see classroom plans a little little bit more inclusive uh but because of the virus situation we've got a um they've got they've gone back to the old school certainly in the in the plans that i've seen for the for the school so mm. Yeah, I think what what the work you're doing is is needed now more than ever. Um and it's yeah, it's incredible. Big big fan. Um tell me just because I'm mindful of of your time and I could talk to you for for hours. Um there's a free five-part training on listening skills on your website. That's right. Yes, at juliantreasure.com. Um if anybody's interested in improving their listening and getting more conscious <laughs> i've managed to persuade one or two um then do pop by juliantreasure.com and you just put your email address in and we will send you five little videos from me which are five exercises designed to bring you on uh, to a more conscious listening um so i hope they work and i hope you enjoy them oh thank you and how else uh, how else are you helping your clients right now how uh, You've got the sound agency. Uh, is there anything else you're, you're doing? You're speaking. I know you have a fantastic speaking career. So um, is there anything else well, you'd like have, to mention? Yes. <laughs> when, when there was speaking to do, uh, now it's all virtual. So that's, it's a different world we're moving into. Um, so yes, and the speaking up to a point. I mean, I'm doing various, um, there are various ways of getting the work out there. I have an online course, seven and a half hours of it on speaking and listening skills. That's pretty intense. There's a book, How to Be Heard, uh, which um, distills a lot of this stuff. It's available from all the usual places. Uh, the sound agency is working for, you know, organizations. Uh, I work with um, training individuals. I don't do one-to-one -one coaching hardly at all. Um, but uh, what I want to do is get the work out to as many people as possible. So the course is a big part of that. And uh, there'll be more stuff coming up in the next few months, actually, I'm on a couple of platforms, which I'm quite excited about, uh, one called Knowable, uh, where I'm developing a course in listening skills. So, you know, there's plenty of 
stuff coming up. Um, so I would just say anybody do pop by the website, sign up and we'll keep you posted. Perfect. Thank you so much, Julian, for your time. It's been a real pleasure. Well, thank you, Toby. Thanks for asking me. This episode of Crisis Cast 2020 was produced by me in London and Kate Astrakhan in Michigan, with artwork by Ryan Field and sound design by Lee Turner. Crisis Cast 2020 is a production from Podcast Network Solutions, a full service podcast production company who are ready to help you plan, record, produce, and promote your message with podcasting. To find out more and grab your copy of Podstar if you're feeling pod curious, visit us at podcastnetworksolutions.com. <laughs>